So today we are going to go to a little village called San Giovanni Val d'Arno. So Val d'Arno means Arno Valley. So San Giovanni in the Arno Valley. And we are going to talk about an artist called Mazzaccio, who um, you'll see was a kind of a major player in the Italian Renaissance. So in the Arno Valley, we're going to talk about San Giovanni Val d'Arno. I'm also going to mention a little spot called San Giovanale, which is on the other side of the river. Sagona, where I make olive oil. And then, of course, um, I also noted Florence on the map. And then Popiano, which is just to the southwest of Florence. So if any of y'all are new here, um, this is where I live at the castle of Popiano, just to the southwest of Florence. Um, and this is my house just outside the castle walls. That's my kitchen door there on the right. So if we do have any new people, if y'all could um, type into the chat um, where y'all are coming from and how you heard about us, that would be great. So we're going to go to San Giovanni Valdarno, which is right in this area between Florence and Siena, which is here. And this was hotly contested territory during the medieval period. And Florence gained control of this territory here in about the year 1300. And in order to um, kind of um, establish some outposts um, for their territory, they had to found some new villages. So they actually founded and populated new villages, terre nuove, new lands. And one of those is this village that's called San Giovanni Valdarno. Um, it was again laid out in 1301. And um, they say in town, they have a lot of urban legends. And Echo Lorenzo, hey Lorenzo. Hi Elaine, how Come are you? Molto Come bene, grazie. <laughs> Voi non potete... Verona. You're in you, Verona. You yeah, in a, play, in a little town near Verona, is a Colonia Veneta, is a, okay. um, a very little town. Yeah, yeah, I can see you, but you cannot see me. I'm in I front of the theater. Uh-huh. Uh, and I'm... Oh, to, look at it, nice. Uh, tonight we have a show. So uh, I, I would like to show you the theater, but I, you are all, already in the lesson, so I don't want to stop oh, your Oh, right, lessons. exactly. Okay. Well, thank you for coming to say hello. <laughs> yeah, and uh, we, we have to, tonight a, a show in, the, in this very uh, Moresco style theater uh, and very amazing places. So uh, we, are, we are not sure that, uh, that tonight was a great show because the, the show is uh, in a Florentine language and oh, we oh. don't and we are in uh, Veneto. So they're in another country. That's like, they're like in yeah. another country. They're in the Veneto. Yeah, hopefully, we, we, I hope the audience will laugh in the right places. Yeah, yeah, we, the <laughs> yeah, we hope that someone uh, in um, usually see in the TV show that there's a lot of Tuscany people, so some some words uh, can uh, can can be friendly. So, but the show is uh, <laughs> <laughs> the show is very interesting because he's an old man uh, who is very Florentine old man. And um, to help himself to make the homeworks, uh, the, the, um, the people send a, a robot, a, an automatic machine, a, a female. And um, I've actually speak, I've seen this production. It's very good. Yeah, <laughs> she, she speaks only Italian and she, he speaks only Florentine. So it's very interesting. No, so, it, it's very funny even if you don't speak Florentine. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> So usually, usually in Florence, when we, we, sh we play the show in uh, Florence, all the, uh, the people uh, seems like uh, the, the old man. Now, tonight, uh, all the people who want, come to see are like the robot. So oh, it's right. very interesting. <laughs> so we, we hope that was a, um, a, a good night. So I, I leave you to your lessons. It's very amazing to say hello to you. Thanks, Lorenzo. And, uh, Ciao, Lorenzo. Buon lavoro. To the next time, I, I'll be there. Okay. Ciao. Right. Ciao. Buona next lezione. time. Grazie. Ciao. 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 <laughs> Lorenzo in Verona. All right, we're going back to San Giovanni Valdarno. So San Giovanni was um, founded in 1301 and literally started from scratch. Um, the urban legend, I was saying, there are actually lots of little urban legends. and. Um, San Giovanni, we'll see another one too. They like to say that Arnolfo di Cambio is the guy who laid out their town and designed their town hall. He is the great sculptor and architect who um, was the head of the cathedral, the Duomo Works Project in Florence. And he designed um, Palazzo Signoria in Florence, for example. And so he's a really important figure 
in um, Florentine architecture. So it could be that he was sent down here or in any event, he was charged with kind of making the blueprint for these new villages that went up and there were several of them. Um, anyway, maybe or maybe not. Whoever did it though was a really forward thinking kind of um, Renaissance thinker because these towns were laid out with um, very much kind of a careful consideration of proportion. And if you look at how um, the village is laid out, it's quite simple, but it's also quite gracious. So there's that great kind of big long um, uh, rectangular piazza that goes north south and the town hall is right there in the middle kind of making two big piazzas out of that and then the main street goes east west right through here and you can see on both of these plans that main street is larger than the other streets and the lots that face main street are actually deeper so there are bigger lots bigger houses um, kind of the nicer properties face main street and then the smaller lanes and um, the other um, kind of the, the rows of houses, the Izawalti they're called, re are reduced in size as they proceed closer to the perimeter walls, right? So the streets are narrower and the, the lot line, the lots are narrower as you get closer to the perimeter walls. Perimeter walls have um, defensive towers and then gates, gate here, here, and on uh, each of the short ends as well. So to populate the town, they literally brought people in. They gave away lots. Um, you had to build, they would give you a lot if you promised to build within a certain amount of time and you had to follow a building code as well. So the town is very much a unified um, kind of design and urban plan. Here's a little uh, view from a drone pilot. You can see uh, the, the kind of two piazzas here with the um, town hall in the middle. And then you can also see how the town has really kind of expanded out, right? A little urban sprawl out here, but the, the central, um, kind of um, Centro Storico, they call it, historic center that was within the old medieval walls still exists pretty much as it was, right? So, I mean, it's been adapted to the modern period, but the footprint is exactly the same. The walls are no longer here, but you can see that this bit of wall got turned into a parking lot. Um, there's a train that runs back here. So the walls no longer exist, but that very heart of town um, is still just the way it was. So when you're on the ground, it's this very, uh, gracious, delightful town, these nice big piazzas. You can sit outside, have a glass of wine right here in the shadow of their great um, town hall, which is sort of typical Tuscan town hall in that over the centuries, all of the mayors and town councilors had their coat of arms tacked up onto the exterior of the building. And it's just kind of fun to look at all these great sculpted or um, uh, enameled terracotta coats of arms from literally over the centuries. Here's the back of the town hall, beautiful building. Again, given over to Arnolfo di Cambia, the architect, who may or may not have built that. And then the little lanes, again, as they get closer to the perimeter walls, you can see how tight they get. And it's a fine town to explore. I and mean, there's a great restaurant under this passageway. It's kind of fun to just poke around and see what's what. Um, here's Main Street with a couple cute shops. Like I said, no, nice cafes, wine bars, no tourists. It's a really fun visit. And there's nice bits of art and just kind of fun things to see. So. Here is um, on the far end of the piazza. This is a church called Santa Maria delle Grazie. And it literally sits on top of the old medieval wall. So remember, let's see, I'm gonna go back to the layout here. This is the Porta San Lorenzo um, at the north end here of um, the big piazza. Now the, the train station's back here, the train runs back here. We saw that in the uh, more modern photo. So look at how this church literally is built on top of Porta San Lorenzo. It, it literally encompasses a section of old medieval wall and the door that was called Porta San Lorenzo. So to get there, you walk in under that loggia, walk in under the loggia and you go through this door, but the door just isn't any old door. It's got this gorgeous um, Giovanni della Robbia um, polychrome terracotta assumption of the Virgin over the door. So this town's just kind of out of the way, but everywhere you turn, there's just some amazing work of art to look at. Um, this church, you'll see why in a minute, um, was very much revered by the townspeople and was kind of lavishly decorated over the century. So when you go through the door here under the Della Robbia um, terracotta assumption, you're actually back in medieval San Giovanni and you're on the old medieval road, right on the interior of the wall, 
um, at the door of uh, called San Lorenzo. And you can see that there is a little kind of memorial plaque here. And you can see that people are still kind of coming to leave flowers, lighting candles. Sometimes you find little notes stuck down here. And so there's this commemorative stone and it commemorates a miracle that happened here. And what's written on the stone, it says here, Mona Tancha prayed and obtained from the most holy virgin abundant milk. All right, so let's find out what that's all about. So here's what it looks like. This is kind of an image of Mona Tantia. Um, in 1478, she comes to pray at the gate and she's praying because there's an image of the Madonna frescoed above the, above the gate. And um, this is, Paul, can y'all still hear me? Okay, good. Um, this is pretty common to have a fresco of a Madonna or a religious figure above a town gate. So Mona Tantia, she has a problem. She comes and she prays to the Madonna. Her miracle, um, her um, wish is granted, she, this miracle occurs, and then literally within sort of five years, this church is built, and this is what the interior of the church upstairs above the loggia looks like. So they have literally built a church that englobes the wall and includes on the high altar the miracle-working Madonna, which is this figure here, which you can see is right here over the high altar. And then on the left of the high altar is the little tiny fresco cycle, which illustrates the miracle of Mona Tantia. And it's complete with captions. So I'm gonna show it to you and just read the captions. So here we go. Mona Tantia of San Giovanni, an old lady of age in years 75. Her son Francesco and daughter, uh, daughter-in-law Santa died of the plague leaving a fanciulo, a little baby boy, whose name was Lorenzo, of age in months three. And he was left in the care of Mona Tancha. Next step, Mona Tancha, one night in her bedroom, abundant milk came to her in her chest miraculously so that she was able to feed the above mentioned baby boy. Um, and he was saved. All of this for the grace conceded by our most glorious Virgin Mary. So you can see she's, Mona is in her bedroom. Her bed is raised up on a wooden platform so it's not too cold, right? Because I'm sure it's freezing in there. She's actually got a brazier going. She has her little metal shovel so she can move her coals around. She's been spinning wool. She's got a cat. So the third um, image in the fresco cycle tells you how this miracle happened. Mona not knowing how to care for the orphaned baby, prayed to an image of the Madonna painted above the San Lorenzo gate of Castel San Giovanni, that the Madonna would grant grace of some sort that would prevent her from seeing that baby die of hunger. That was her, that was her prayer. And the oral history of San Giovanni goes on to recount the details of the story that aren't included here, which is that since the parents of this child died of the plague, there were wet nurses that could take in a baby and you know, nurse the baby to keep the baby alive, but they were worried the baby had the plague, the wet nurses wouldn't take him. So Monotantra didn't know what to do. Um, she ended up nursing him herself and she nursed him exactly from three months to 20 months. And we know that because they just passed this down all throughout the ages. So that's one of the claims to fame of San Giovanni Valdarno. Another slightly more important claim to fame is that this is the birthplace of the artist called Mazzaccio. He was born Tommaso di Ser Giovanni here in this house, right on the main street born in San Giovanni in 1401, died in 1428 in Rome before his 27th birthday, died at age 26. Um, despite that, this is the guy, it's a self-portrait you're looking at there on the right. He is credited with developing the style we call the Renaissance. He brought painting in Florence from the late Gothic style into the Renaissance. I mean, he literally in, the sh in his very short career changed the course of Western art. So he was born to a notary in San Giovanni, hence the kind of nice fancy house right on the main street, and was given a very good education. Um, he was known to have been a very good student and quite intelligent. His dad, though, died when he was five and, and suspected that maybe there was some kind of congenital illness um, since both Mazacho and his father died at a you know, super young age. Um, in any event, we believe as a boy that he and his younger brother, he had a younger brother, were sent to live with his grandparents. And one of his grandparents was called Simone, um, Monet for short, Cassai. That was his nickname, Monet Cassai, because what he did was he made cassone. And this is what a cassone looks like. There are these large, elaborate um, storage chests 
And this is what noble women kept their fancy gowns in. So, you know, they're very elaborately carved gilt and they have this painted panel on the front. So the painted panel you see on the bottom is actually done by Mazacha's brother. He was known as Loskeja, the splinter. He was tall and skinny, so they called him the splinter. So Loskeja lived a full life. He wasn't quite as talented as his older brother Mazacho, but we have some little tidbits of documentation from the brother that kind of help us fill in some blanks on Masacho's uh, very short and not super well documented life. So we know that um, they learned how to paint from uh, their grandfather, Monet Kasai. We also know that by 1417, the brothers went to Florence. Their mother had remarried, was living in Florence in the Santo Spirito neighborhood. So off they go, they're painters, they go to, they go to Florence. And we know that Mazzaccio starts hanging out with this kind of older crowd of avant-garde artists. And he is almost taken under the wing of Brunelleschi. Again, an older guy, he's an architect, he's a mathematician, he's a theoretician. And uh, Brunelleschi is known for, for example, we know him for having designed the cupola of the Duomo, which you see there on the right. He also was working right in these years or early years of the 1400s, he was working on theories of perspective, mathematically working out how to plot perspective using sight lines and vanishing points to create kind of fictive, you know, an idea of 3D space. And he was really famous during this period, early 1400s, for having done what is now a lost drawing of the octagonal baptistry, uh, which sits right in front of the Duomo in Florence. And you can see kind of a recreation of that there on the right. So um, we know even that Brunelleschi was kind of happy to be able to teach Masaccio because Masaccio was so interested and he was a good student and picked this stuff right up. Um, he was also in the same crowd with Donatello, Again, a much older artist, clearly a sculptor. This is Donatello's um, St. George on the exterior of Or San Michele, which was completed in 1416-17, right when Masaccio um, and his brother ended up in Florence. So you can see here Masaccio, again, friends with Masaccio in the same crowd with Brunelleschi. Masaccio is putting to use um, Brunelleschi's um, theories on perspective. And he's, you can really see a good example of that in the Predella panel that very low relief, this is St. George who is killing the dragon. This is the dragon's cave. This is the princess who St. George is saving. And notice how they're in the foreground and then space recedes uh, beyond um, them into the background. And you can see there's a vanishing point right about here. And you can actually follow the flight lines down from this loggia, which you see on the right. So here Donatello is using Brunelleschi's theories. So, um, Mazzaccio has learned to paint from his grandfather. He's hanging out with Donatello, the mathematician who's studying perspective. He's hanging, excuse me, Brunelleschi. He's hanging out with Donatello, the sculptor who's putting this to, to use. He's also studying older works of art, such as frescoes by Giotto. This is the death of St. Francis in the Bardi Chapel in Santa Croce in Florence. The first seeds of this humanistic approach to painting, this is early 1300s. This, um, movement in art kind of got nipped in the bud because there was another plague outbreak in um, 1348. Two thirds of the population died. People were freaked out and the public really reverted to old fashioned tastes. So this kind of stuff was available to see in Florence and Masaccio took full advantage of that but the prevailing style in painting is international Gothic. And this is what the prevailing style in painting looks like at the time when Masaccio got to Florence. This is the Adoration of the Magi by Gentile da Fabriano. This was done in 1423 um, on commission from a very important um, uh, Florentine. And you can see it's this gorgeous painting. It's quite flat though, in a sense, that recession into space is relatively awkward. So it's kind of a flat composition, very colorful, ornamental. Color is used really to kind of create this very graceful image, which is much more symbolic than, than strictly realistic. So this is the prevailing style of painting. Mazzaccio is studying Giotto. He's hanging out with Brunelleschi. He's hanging out with Donatello and he's a painter. And so he kind of starts doing his own thing and he gets a chance to do that. Remember now he's about, he's very young. He's in his early twenties. So he's a painter, he's in his early twenties, um, 1424. And he's paired with another artist. And they are asked by another important Florentine, uh, Felice Brancacci, to do a series of um, uh, a fresco cycle with a series of images 
of some Old Testament scenes and the life of St. Peter, the works of St. Peter. And so he's paired up with this artist who he collaborates with called Mazzolino. So you're looking at the center is the chapel that they decorated together. On the left is Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden done by Mazzolino, an older painter who is still kind of painting in that Gothic style. And then on the right is Mazzaccio, who's just doing his own thing, um, putting together everything that he's learned. And you're looking at, of course, Adam and Eve who are being tossed out of the Garden of Eden. So Mazzaccio clearly breaks with the Gothic style. He's described at, at the time, he was described as painting puro senza ornato, pure without ornamentation, right? It's not sparkly, it's not decorative. Color is not used because it's fancy or pretty or wants your eye to leap around the composition. He's actually used to construct volumes. He's painting solid, simple, weighty figures. These are realistic human forms. He's placed them kind of rationally in space. He's using natural light. Look at how they cast shadows as opposed to their um, medieval, medieval selves when they're still in the Garden of Eden, Eden as painted by Mazzolino. They also convey human emotion. So they've eaten the apple, they are cast out of the Garden of Eden and they have screwed up and they know it. They're extremely unhappy. It was you know, a very moving image. I'm gonna show you a closer up image of that. Here they are. Adam and Eve, very unhappy. Um, we're gonna take just a look at a couple of images of very large fresco cycle and then see some other works by Masaccio. Um, so you're seeing a, another close up there of Adam and Eve being shut out of the Garden of Eden on the left and on the right, St. Peter baptizing. And um, again, notice kind of these sculptural powerful forms, puro senza ornato, they are pure, they're not ornate. They're you know, modeled very delicately with color and light. These particular works influenced Michelangelo who came along 80 years later. And he went and I believe he drew these works. We know that he, uh, that he sued them and he saw them. So um, again, Masaccio has really made a radical break with uh, Gothic style. Here's another um, image where both of the painters um, young, very young guy, Mazzaccio, and the, the older artist that he's collaborating with, they worked on these together. So this is St. Peter, who's working miracles, and he appears twice. He's wearing the, um, the orange, kind of orangish robe. On the left, he's healing a crippled, and on the right, he's raising a Tabitha. And um, notice the two figures in the middle, these guys, very much kind of medieval. Their feet are just sort of, you know, not exactly bearing lots of weight. They have these very delicate features, fancy headgear, um, you know, fancy robes. They're kind of ornate, right? They're, they're not so puro senza ornato. They're, they are ornato, they, they're ornate. These were done by Mazzolino, the collaborator. Um, the figure of St. Peter seems to really have some of that more weight of Mazzaccio. And then look at the space that Mazzaccio here created. He basically is painting San Giovanni. There's these two loges that face onto this nice wide piazza that have views of these little lanes that come out of the piazza. And he's used what he learned from Brunelleschi in order to really clearly plot out this space in which to place his figures. So Masaccio is the first person, first artist to translate into painting what Brunelleschi had developed and what Donatello had done, uh, had been doing in stone. This is a revolution. Um, Masaccio is referred to as the first modern painter because of this total break with that Gothic style. And he's been you know, so successful at creating this kind of illusionistic space, placing figures rationally in space. He's conquered the third dimension. This is huge. Um, it's absolutely enormous. And this is why he literally changed the course of Western art. Here's his last work. I believe this is his last work. This was done just the year before he died. There may be something after this. Um, the Trinity, the Holy Trinity in the Church of Santa Maria Novella in Florence done in 1427 for Domenico Lenzi, uh, another Florentine. So this is an enormous, enormous um, fresco. Your eye level, your you know, direct line of vision is here at the base where the, um, the donors are kneeling. And what he's done is, again, created this sort of fictive recession of space, this barrel vault that goes back beyond the wall. There's like this you know, large space that we're kind of you know, viewing these heavenly figures on the other side of the wall. And it's got all the hallmarks of um, Masaccio's kind of mature style. We call it his mature style, even though he died at age 26. So 
we don't know what his mature style really would have looked, looked like. So here's this kind of portrait of the Madonna, you know, beautiful figure, very solemn, you know, kind of gesturing for us to take in the image of the crucified Christ who is being held up sort of gently by God the Father, who's in uh, further back in the apse. St. John is also at the base of the cross. And then there's this fictive architecture. And on the other side of those columns and those big pilasters with the Corinthian capitals are life-size portraits of the donors. They're kind of in our space, right? So all these figures are placed realistically in this structure which is certainly derived from Brunelleschi's theories of perspective and may really have been designed together with Brunelleschi. It's quite possible that Brunelleschi kind of helped um, you know, plot the sight lines and choose the vanishing point. And so the space that has been created um, illusionistically, if it were real, this is what it would look like in section, okay? So this is the viewer over here, your sight line hits right here. This is the donor, the back of Mr. Lindsay. And then you go up a step, two columns, and here's the Madonna at the base of the cross. Here's the cross with Christ, and then there's this kind of ledge back here. So God's not hovering in the heavens. God's a person, basically. He's standing on a ledge, and he's kind of holding up the cross. Brilliant, um, brilliant kind of and successful elaboration of these Renaissance theories. So he's in, Masaccio at this point is in full power of doing this. So the question is what came before this, right? So he, he had to have kind of worked this out in his art. He was named as a painter in 1417. He died in 1428, nine years of a career. So most of the, all of the works of art that we know about um, of Mazzaccio's are dated between 1424 and 1428, that's four years. That's five years prior where, you know, what's going on? You know, he must have somehow been arriving at his um, kind of very um, masterful use of perspective. So we did not know what any of his early works looked like. We now have exactly one. It was found in the 1960s and it was found near San Giovanni where he lived here in the Val d'Arno at a tiny little church. There was this great art historian called Luciano Berti who became director of the Uffizi Galleries in Florence. But in the early 60s, he was the superintendent for fine arts for the province of Arezzo, this area. And he would, um, just kind of beat the bushes looking for works of art in all these tiny little churches in the area. Um, and he literally turned up um, a Masaccio painting in a little hamlet called San, uh, San Giovanale. So he's like having coffee in the bar in Mugello and asked, anybody know of any paintings in around here? And somebody said, oh yeah, there's something on the floor behind the altar in San Giovanale. So off he goes. This is what San Giovanale looks like today. This is the church. This is what it looked like in the 60s. So I'd actually heard that this painting was discovered in a hay barn. I think the, the actual story is that the custodian of the church, when Hitler's troops moved through, the custodian of the church to protect the painting from being stolen by Hitler's troops, like so many uh, paintings uh, in Europe um, were stolen, he took it home and hid it in his hay barn, but then he brought it back to the church. But the church, the altar of this church, the church was built in the 1100s, and renovated a lot and updated a lot. So the altar looks like this. They didn't need this. They didn't need a painting on the altar. So the painting, he literally just put it on the floor behind the altar. It's back in the church. It's back there somewhere. Um, so Berti discovers it and here's what it is. So we've got this amazing early work by Masaccio. So it's kind of a mix of sort of that Gothic gold background, the three separate panels, very, um, very um, kind of classic Gothic altarpiece. But there are some innovations in here that make it clear that he's already, you know, kind of in the circle of Brunelleschi. So this is a work that's dated, it's actually got the date written on it, 23 April, 1422. Um, Mazancho's 20 years old and that's um, a good two years before he does the Brancacci Chapel up in um, Florence. He's already in Florence, he's already in the circle of Brunelleschi and he's asked, um, to come down uh, to paint anyway, um, this altarpiece for a family who has this little church in the area where, um, where he was born. And so you're looking at the Madonna and child with um, uh, enthroned with two angels at the bottom of the throne and then two saints on either side. And the saints are Bartolomeo and Biagio and uh, San Giovanale and St. Anthony Abbot. They're the patron saints of the family who um, 
commissioned the work of art and patron saints of agriculture, which is very appropriate to the region. Interestingly, the way that they hold their staffs kind of helps place them in space. I mean, notice that like San Giovanni, who's here, you know, his staff is stuck out a couple of feet, you know, before um, his feet. And so he, of course, is occupying that space behind the staff and in front of the gold wall. He's also holding the Bible, which is strongly projecting out into space. So this is very successful, dramatic, foreshortened hand and book. This is kind of typical of Masaccio. Um, not everybody could do this. This is kind of difficult. So um, that in and of itself is um, kind of a tour de force. Interestingly, they applied handwriting analysis to, this is a Bible verse, um, Psalm 109. And they compared the handwriting here to a text document that um, Masaccio filled out and signed himself and the handwriting matches up. So we already figured it was, or, Luciano Berti figured it was a Masaccio, but that's kind of the, the final proof there is they actually did the handwriting analysis to confirm that the handwriting is the same. Just here's just two great um, details of some of those uh, saints on either side of the Madonna. Love that, the piercing look. Look at St. Anthony, it's kind of got, you know, the older guy, it's got his like red rimmed eyes. Great beards too. So here's the Madonna. He's, um, again, doing some very innovative things. Masaccio is also kind of following some um, um, style uh, choice, making some style choices that are kind of, you know, things that are being done by other artists in this period, such as he's used pseudo-Arabic text on the halo of the Madonna. This sort of places the Madonna in the Middle East, right? That's where she's from. So this kind of alludes to that, even though she's very fair-skinned and blonde, which is kind of a Masaccio thing. Um, he's also got this kind of motif of the baby Jesus standing up in his mother's hands. You can see that here, baby Jesus standing up in his mother's hands. They're sitting off, they're sitting in this kind of um, wonderful Roman type throne with the inlaid marble and the throne is sort of an oval and it's kind of created this oval to hold this image. Um, so they're actually kind of enclosed in this space and there's the Christ child kind of, she's holding one of his feet. He's standing up and he's holding onto a bunch of grapes. It's kind of hard to see the paint has been abraded off the surface here. Um, this is not something you see very often. There are, again, a couple paintings like this around the 14, sort of around that date, 1420. Um, so the idea of course, is that the grapes allude to the eventual sacrifice of the blood of Christ and the wine that's used in the Eucharist. And then Christ even seems to maybe be eating a grape, right? He's got two fingers in his mouth, like maybe he's you know, eating a sweet piece of fruit. Um, lovely details. And then notice too, that great kind of diaphanous drape that Masaccio has painted. And he's used a special kind of white paint to do this. It's called Bianco di Argento, and it's very hard to manage. It's not the same white that you use to make dark pink. You know, you mix in some white to make it turn light pink. This is, a, this is a kind of a white that doesn't mix. Um, and you use it to do things like this diaphanous stripe. And it's very hard to, to deal with. And it really shows his kind of um, master um, um, maestranza, as they say, of the um, techniques. Look at how beautiful it is here. The drapes, and you can see the Madonna is kind of, um, kind of grabbing onto the chubby shoulder of the Christ child and kind of wrinkling up that just that gorgeous thin diaphanous little drape. Just beautiful little details. Another kind of innovative move here is the lost profile of the two adoring angels. You know, you're not seeing them in profile. You're not seeing the back of their head. You're seeing this just more than three quarter view. It's amazing. I mean, it's really out there choice paired up with this kind of old fashioned dinner plate in your face halo. It's not long after this that you get the little, you know, just a little vague little ring of gold above your head to indicate the halo here. It's like the full on, you know, in your face. Um, he's also really showing the form of these little tiny angels. You can see their legs and look at his little feet even. You kind of see that through that gorgeous pink drape. And then below them, is the date right here. And it says MCCCCXXII 1422 ID 23 April on the day 23rd of April. There you go. So here's another huge innovation. Also notice the flooring here is these green kind of green myelica tiles. 
So we've got the three different um, sections, this tripartite Gothic altarpiece, but what Masaccio has done here is that he's linked all three panels spatially by having the sight lines recede back to one single vanishing point, which is there in the center. And he's kind of gotten some help from the grout lines of the green tiles. So this is really the beginning then of Renaissance painting. So he goes on to paint, um, you know, maybe the more kind of um, modern looking Brancacci Chapel or Trinity in Santa Maria Novella. But this is where he kind of got started. This painting, again, thanks to, I believe, the superintendent of fine arts of the 1960s is still, you know, they could have, this could easily be shown in the Uffizi in Florence or taken to some major gallery in Rome. And it's not, it's in a little diocesan museum here behind the apse of the great uh, Romanesque church in Rigello, which is right near San Giovanni. So back in San Giovanni, they have a little diocesan museum too. This is, I think, a fairly particularly Italian kind of a setup, these diocesan museums. There are great works of art all over the place. And for example, um, what we're about to look at was in a monastery in the area. The monasteries were suppressed in the 1800s and all this art had to go somewhere and it went into these um, diocesan museums. That's kind of one way that they get their collections. So one work of art here um, in the diocesan museum here in um, San Giovanni is this amazing panel by, of all people, Fra Angelico. He's a painter from Florence. He's working just a couple decades after the very early death of Masaccio and he's heavily influenced by Masaccio. He's also a very devout Dominican friar. So he kind of still uses some of that kind of grace of the international Gothic kind of for spiritual reasons, right? He likes the symbolism of that. Um, but he's also combining it with the new developments in the Renaissance as used in painting for the first time by Masaccio, such as Notice the um, realistic placement of figure, figures in a rational space, right? He's kind of created this um, loggia. It's open on two sides, inside of which there is, this is the Annunciation to Mary. So Gabriel kind of floats into this um, loggia space to give Mary the news that she is about to become the mother of Christ. Here's a little detail of Mary looking rather shocked. There's a prophet here who's kind of sending the Holy Spirit on down to Mary. And then here's this, the detail of this great angel, just absolutely gorgeous, the, the drapery, the feathers of his wings, very interesting marble. I was, the first time I saw this, I just couldn't work it out. This is fictive marble, but it's also almost kind of otherworldly. And that's the kind of thing that Frangelico would do. It's like, you know, this is an otherworldly moment that's happening here, right? So he's kind of created this, interesting fictive marble. And then look at what's happening outside the space. There's this lush garden, lush garden that turns into this barren hillside where here we see again, Adam and Eve are being cast out of the Garden of Eden. And of course, there's, you know, they're going to be saved by the eventual sacrifice of Christ. And this is kind of that moment of, um, you know, the first sort of promise of the coming of Christ. So these two um, uh, works of art are, like I said, still on view in these just you know, tiny museums in these tiny little towns, super fun visit. And there's such high quality works of art, both the Fra Angelico Annunciation and Masaccio's, um, they call it the, tr the triptych of San Giovanale, just luminous. You know, there, you know, there are other works of art on view in these um, small, small galleries. And you go in there and these things just jump out at you just from the inherent light coming out of them. Really amazing works of art. And then in this same area, um, we're about to, um, segue into our cooking segment. So in the same area on Prato Manu, in the Val d'Arno, near um, both of these towns we just talked about is the farm called Sagona where I make olive oil. And we're gonna make two recipes that kind of highlight the olive oil. So I'm showing you our groves. We're on the side of the mountain. Our olives are um, planted on dry stone uh, terraces. Terraces held up uh, dry stone walls. This is how we pick, it's a little bit laborious. I'm picking a little rake and there's, um, my colleague, Nicola, who has a little electric kind of a, brrr, a little mechanized unit, but you can see how steep it is. Look how he's standing, super steep. So we're gonna use olive oil made like you just saw above to make two recipes. One is chachata di maiale, and you can see the um, ingredients there and then ciambelline cookies. Stop my share. 
going to move into the kitchen. So we're going to make this chachata, which is basically chickpeas. And I have these kind of little chickpeas from Prato Mano. They're minute. You can use any chickpeas. Look how tiny they are. They're really good. Um, they also make really good hummus. So we're going to use chickpeas, a little bit of pork, and kale. And this recipe comes from, this is a, um, by the way, this is a cut of pork called scamerita. It's kind of a, a fattier cut that comes from kind of shoulder. Um, I'm just gonna make a portion here. The recipe comes from a great old fashioned um, family run trattoria in Florence. And I've kind of added a few, um, kind of adapted it a little bit, adding some typical spices from Baldarno namely fennel flowers, which is one of my favorites. So I'm gonna cut the pork into relatively small pieces. The dish is mostly vegetables. The pork gives it a little bit of, um, a little bit more protein and a little bit of flavor. So um, the idea though is just a tiny bit of meat and um, bigger portions of the vegetables. And then I'm gonna kind of get this going. Um, it's gonna, some of the fat will um, kind of melt out and help flavor the dish, but I'm gonna add a little bit of olive oil to the pan. And with the kale, such a strong flavor, I'm gonna use our stronger flavored olive oil, which is dispensa, which is the oil that we made this year in Puglia. This one. So with my um, business partner, Daniele, we decided to add um, to our lineup this year. Um, see if I can make my burner go on. Um, an oil from the south. That doesn't wanna go. So this year we made this oil in Puglia, actually went down to Puglia for olive harvest. And um, from Coratina olives, we made the oil called Dispensa. Um, from next year, that will be Sicily, so stay tuned. My burner doesn't want to light. There we go. And we decided to do that just so we could have um, kind of an extra, extra flavors to play with in the kitchen. It was really fun to kind of just do food matches. And that's why um, I decided with the, um, the kind of strongly flavored kale and the other flavors that I'm putting in here, um, to use the dispenser olive oil, which really kind of sets off all of those um, kind of strong flavors and really kind of brings them together, which kind of makes the flavors harmonize. So the I'm going to just brown the meat and then we're going to use kale, um, which is just still coming out of the gardens here. It's kind of starting to go tiny. With, tiny, with the tiny little leaves, we like to make pesto with it. Um, but with the bigger leaves, uh, we make things like the chachata and to, to cook with the kale, you just have to strip out that um, kind of the um, costone there. And you really can just kind of get it started with your fingers and then it just strips right out. You can just kind of separate the leaf out from the, the ribs. And then these get boiled in salted water for just a few minutes. These are all really typical Tuscan flavors. And this is kind of one of those, kind of a quintessential Tuscan dish. There's just kind of nothing to it. But once it all comes together, um, it's, my, my boyfriend said, it's a winner. It's a winner. So the meat is getting going. Just gonna kind of let it brown. And I'm gonna add a little bit of salt some black pepper, have a good amount of black pepper, and fennel flowers. I think y'all heard me talk about fennel flowers a lot. Um, see if I can. I wish I, I wish y'all could smell these. They are so good. You can get these from Olio To Go, who also sells Sagona olive oil and online 
um, retailer. They also have a storefront in um, Northern Virginia near Washington, D.C. The perfume here is amazing. And this just really goes so well with pork and just kind of makes this dish. This is kind of what, this is what makes this dish a winner, right? It goes from being beans and kale to being a winner. So I'm gonna kind of go heavy on the um, fennel flowers. I've got this on pretty high heat, so I want the, I want the fat of the pork to melt a little bit, and I want a little bit of kind of crisp on the meat itself. So I'm gonna boil the kale. I'm gonna put a little salt in the water. Um, a little salt in the water helps the natural salt of the kale stay in the kale. You, you, you lose less flavor from the vegetable if you add just a teeny bit of salt in the water. And then I've also already boiled the chickpea. So I'm gonna add some chickpeas here. I'm gonna add a little bit of the chickpea broth. And then you know how when you um, mash um, the beans a little bit, kind of it gets the starch kind of makes a little kind of thicken um, up your the liquid a little bit. It's almost kind of, it's not really a sauce, but it just kind of adds like a thickener. So I'm gonna add some uh, chickpeas and just a little bit of broth, and then I'm gonna smash some of the chickpeas. So Elaine, kind of uh, we got a, a couple questions here. Um, someone was asking okay. about the fennel that you were adding and the fennel flour. And uh -huh. are there similarities between that and the bulb of the fennel or what, what are your comments on that? No, those are two different things. Um, the bulb is a different plant and wild fennel is what we're using when we use the, um, usually when you use seeds or when I'm using the flowers, like actual little yellow flowers that the, um, um, that the wild fennel plants make. So these are wild fennel plants that grow in this case on the side of Patamania there, um, right literally where those paintings are, are kept in those small museums. Um, so it's two different, operations and the flowers are super aromatic it's just they're way different than the seeds if you have the seeds you might want to try smashing them in a mortar and pestle to kind of release a little bit more aroma but the flowers like it's just it's just a whole nother level of aroma and it's just it's really particular um, and if you've never tried them I recommend I really recommend it and you can find them and I'll, I'll include a link in the recipes tomorrow um, or Paul you might want to type that in the chat oleotogo.com has the fennel flowers. So I'm kind of adding a little bit of, um, of the cooking water um, from the chickpeas, smashing the chickpeas. I'm about to add the kale and you can also add some of the liquid from the kale. The finished dish is dry, but it, um, it just, because of the starch and the beans, it kind of, it almost has kind of a little sauciness to it. So what did you do to cook the, the chickpeas? What was the process there? I boiled them in water, boiled them in water. That's it, I did nothing. Um, I soaked them overnight. I soaked the chickpeas overnight. I put them in water and boiled them for about an hour and then they were done and that's all I did. And now I'm just smashing some. That's kind of a key little, kind of a key little trick to just change changes the consistency of the whole thing. In fact, if I can show you, I'm gonna to try to show you um, the pan. You can see the, can you see the consistency? There's too much steam, I don't know if you can see it. Can you see the consistency of, it's not just not that runny. It's kind of thick in there. You can just, you can even see how the chickpeas are moving around in there. It just gets kind of thick. So again, the final dish is not, it's not a soup at all. It's very much a solid thing. Um, But as you're cooking, the heat is relatively high here. So um, the liquid kind of boils out and then blends in with the
the chickpea starch. I'm going to just finally chop the kale. Um, it doesn't have to be squeezed out necessarily because like I just said, a little bit of liquid is actually a good thing. Um, you might want to do this ahead of time so you're not dealing with totally boiling kale. But that really doesn't take long at all. The kale just, you can, you can if you don't like it, um, I, I kind of like it to have some consistency. You can, in fact, cook it for a longer, a longer amount of time if you um, prefer it to be kind of more cooked. I kind of like it like this, just a couple of minutes in salted boiling water. And I'm chopping it up pretty fine. Elaine, um, one um, person is uh, wondering, Katie's wondering um, about the chickpea skins, if they're ever a problem and, uh, or um, if there's any comments you have about that. In this dish, chickpea skins are not a problem. I am not, um, I'm, they, some people take them out when they make hummus. You get a smoother hummus if you take the chickpea skins out. Um, I, I usually leave them in anyway, I don't, they don't bother me. Um, and in this dish, you don't notice them at all. So you really, this is a super rustic dish. You do not need to worry about that at all. All right. Um, also, someone's asking about your cookware. Oh, um, my cookware. Yeah. Uh, my cookware is a mix of random hotel restaurant shops in Arezzo, actually, now that I think about it. I'm going to add a little more liquid and I'm going to use the kale liquid. And the other two pans are Viking Range. Back when Viking Range used to make Viking Range, who sponsored my range, they also used to make cookware and that's what these two pans are. And they are great. I don't think they do that anymore. Um, I could be wrong. If somebody wants to correct me, feel free. I'm going to add a little bit more chickpeas. and a little bit more kale, and then we'll be done. If you have any more questions. Um, if y'all, y'all might have seen, if y'all are here, you also saw that we've organized some um, small group trips. And y'all can see on my website, the listings for small group trips, which um, we're starting in June, although I think maybe it's a little too early for everybody. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to go in June or not. It seems to be a little bit uh, kind of a, maybe early because of the pandemic to actually go in June. We have a Sicily trip in the fall, which we actually just sold out, and we're going to offer it again in the spring. And then we have a Tuscany trip the next spring as well. So if y'all are interested, check it out on the website, um, elainechristian.com small group trip. Paul, you might want to type that in the chat, although I think everybody knows where to go for that. So it's going to be really fun, and Lorenzo is going to be there. I'm not sure if Paul is going to be there, but Lorenzo is going to be there. We're going to do some cooking with Lorenzo, and we're going to see Lorenzo and Florence as well. Um, and it's going to be fun. All right, so that is it for the um, chachata. I'm going to serve it up and um, show you also um, the cookies. So again, the chachata is simple, simple, simple ingredients with a good amount of black pepper and a large amount of fennel flowers. And I started it in olive oil and to serve it, I am gonna use even more olive oil. So give it some kind of swirl of fresh dispensa olive oil on top. And I like a lot of olive oil. And then I like to serve this with a spoon. It's um, just kind of, cause it's sort of comforting. It's not, again, it's not at all a um, soup. It's not soupy at all. It's very much kind of dry, consistent, kind of consistent. Um, great, oh my gosh, the aromas are all kind of kale and olive oil and, Fennel flowers is great. So I'm all right. Dessert is 
um, olive oil cookies. And I've actually made them ahead of time and they are with um, just flour, sugar, olive oil and Bensanto. So for this recipe, I used Bensanto, which is a kind of a sweet oxidative dessert wine. You can use any um, oxidative wine, like even Marsala, if you can't get a hold of Bensanto. Um, you could also just use white wine. And I used um, our Tuscan olive oil, which um, has just arrived in the United States, um, Prima Raccolto at Olio to go. So the same company that has the fennel flowers has our Sagona olive oil. This is our Tuscan olive oil. And this is what I used for the cookies. Um, and this is what the dough looks like. So I just made an, a simple dough. These are the way, the way that we make pasta um, by making a well in the flour um, right on the uh, work surface. And then it's literally flour, sugar, olive oil, then sancho, and just a little pinch of um, leavening agent. And I'll, the recipe actually is on my website and I'll be sending it tomorrow. And this is what the dough looks like when you're finished. It's kind of this very consistent dough and you just kind of make a little ring out of it. And here are the cookies when they're finished. They're just these toasty good olive oil cookies with Vincento. Very good. I want one. The aroma is in here. I, I wish I could just at least just smell them even. You'll have to make them so you can so you can try it out. Someone's asking um, uh, if you can use sweet vermouth or just plain red wine with the cookies. Some thoughts on I would that? use white wine before red wine, although I've done it with red wine. That's used the possibility. Um, and then vermouth. Um, you could use it for a mousse, that would work. I think for mousse would work. I think sherry would work too, like a drier one. Um, I don't know if you want to dump sherry into your cookie recipe or not, um, but it's an idea. Um, so yeah, y'all can play around with that. Any more questions? Um, someone else is asking about uh, how you would serve this. Would you do family style with this kind of meal or what, what your thoughts are on that? This is, first of all, this is what's called a piatto unico. It's one plate, which means you don't serve first course, second course. This is actually both courses all together. So you just have the one dish. It's kind of, it's, I mean, it's really simple. Um, yeah, I'm gonna just, I'm actually, I have friends who are coming over for supper and I'm just gonna put, um, you know, a big kind of bowl of it on the table and we're gonna have this and a salad and a glass of wine, that's it. Um, and then cookies. So simple, simple kind of, yeah, family style. So what wine would you, are you going to put with it? I, um, so this is very much a rustic, kind of rustic Tuscan dish. And I am going to use a simple um, Chianti, um, or anyway, Sangiovese. I shouldn't have even said the word Chianti. Um, Sangiovese from Valdardino, from Sagona. And here's a bottle. Chianti is the area that Florence took over in 1300. We're higher up on the mountain. So this is um, one of, I've already been drunk, uh, Sagona, red wine, Sangiovese from the mountain of Prato Magno, or any kind of young, um, a young Chianti would be fine. So a Sangiovese that's got a, some good acidity and tannin to it goes really well with the pork and the olive oil and you're done. Great meal. Okay. Um, a couple other uh, quick uh, questions here. Um, someone had asked about using basil flour if you had uh, flowers of basil, do you, if you use that much? Um... I think that would be too delicate. This is not a delicate dish. I think you need something with a little bit more punch to it. I think you would lose it. You would lose the flavor. Okay. And, and, and what, um, and then, and then the recipes will go out tomorrow or they'll be on the website. Recipes going out tomorrow. The cookies are already on the website um, and the other two are in. So if you've registered for the class, you'll get an email with the recipes. And if you have not registered and you want them, register. Excellent. Okay, all right, so I will be in touch tomorrow. I'll also read through the chat um, in case there are any other questions we didn't get to. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Paul, thank you for sitting in for Lorenzo. We appreciate it. Sure. Very good, Fine. Elaine. Thank you. Thanks, thanks y'all. Thank good you. Day, everybody. Fascinating Bye. art history. Bye. Thank Have you, Elaine. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Suzanne. Hey, Eileen. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, y'all. <laughs>